Thanks for joining us this hour. You're watching Network Africa. Here's what's coming up. Senegal's opposition candidate, Basuru Diomaye Faye, officially declared winner of the presidential elections, winning 54.28% of the total votes. French court confirms conviction of former Liberian rebel Kunti Kamara for his role during the country's civil war. Plus, Togo's opposition rejects constitutional reform, calls for protest. Welcome once again. I'm Jokia Rogers here in Lagos. Vote coalition is over and opposition candidate Basiru Diomaye Faye has officially been declared winner of the Senegalese presidential elections, winning 54.28% of votes in the first round. Reports from the country's Vote Counting Commission, which falls under the judiciary, states that Faye placed well ahead of the governing coalition's candidate, former Prime Minister Amadou Ba who had 35.79% of the votes. According to authorities, the election recorded a voter turnout of 61%. Mr. Faye, now Africa's youngest elected president, has said he will rule Senegal with humility and fight corruption. He also promised to put measures in place to address youth unemployment and a high cost of living in the country. Let's get more insight and analysis on this. African Affairs Analyst Ibrahim Anoba joins us now for more. Hi, Ibrahim. Great to see you today. Uh, first, let's get your thoughts on the just concluded elections in Senegal. History made in Africa. The youngest president produced. What's your general assessment of the poll outcome? Thank you for having me, Joke. I, I think this is uh, fantastic news for not only Senegal, but for the continent in general, and for three reasons. Uh, first is that this is a reflection of the priorities of Senegal's youth. As you know, about 60% of the population of Senegal are either 25 or below the age of 25. In fact, if you put randomly two Senegalese out of any part of the country, chances are that at least one of those two people will be 18 years old or younger. So that's really massive. And it's also in a country where in the last three, four years, we've seen uh, youth unemployment really be, become a problem. About 22% of those who are actually employable as youth, are, they do not have a job. And uh, of course, people often talk about the economic prosperity uh, in Senegal, but that really hasn't transformed into uh, more money in the, in the pulse of, of young people in Senegal. And if you also look at the last few presidents Senegal has had, uh, not only Macky Sall, but also the one before him, Ahmad, uh, uh, President Abdullah Wade, and, uh, and, the, and the one before Abdullah Wade, they, they are all older people, and they came into power with different priorities. These are people that have been in power for, for decades even before, before becoming president. So now to have someone who is young and whose reality seems to align with the realities of, of, of the younger population is massive. But the second key thing here is about France. As we've seen with coups on the, on the continent in the last three years, more so in the, in, in the former French colonies, one common thread of language among people is that they wanted to reject France, that France has held uh, the, the, the financial and even political sovereignty of these countries, like Senegal, for a long time since uh, at the end of colonization. As a matter of fact, one of the core messages of uh, the now present elect uh, Basir Faye is to remove the country from the CFA Franc zone, which is pretty much the way France has uh, ruled the financial sovereignty or the financial um, state of this former French colonies uh, for, for decades. So, so those two key things are, are really observant here. But the last one that I really want to be uh, be conscious of is that this also goes to show the strength and resolve that the democracy Senegal has had. One of the countries where you can actually boost of stable elections and no coups uh, since independence. So it's really interesting to see this pan out regardless 
of the of the uh, obstetrophy, the announcement and cancellation we've seen uh, from President from President Macky So it's it's really a testament to to the many uh, key points uh, that has dominated this election the last one or two years. And so the winner of this election, just 44, as we said earlier, never held an elective position. Um, he's uh, an opposition uh, party. His party is an opposition party, and he ran against. Uh, no, the ruling party. Did you see his win coming? Were you surprised by it? Well, wasn't really surprised because uh, you know uh, Usman Sonko was supposed to contest uh, against uh, uh, against the prime minister, but because of the numerous legal case on the neck of Sonko, uh, fire had to be placed in in in, in his replacement. And, and the Sonko factor is there. People want to change. Sonko has been dominant in, in the political corridors in Senegal for, for a while now, which is part of the reasons why the powers that be in Senegal put him in jail. So apart from the Sonko factor, we see that poverty is really massive in the country these days. About I, I think about 40% of the population in the, of the country is, is, is impoverished, live the, be, live the lowly poverty line. So, I mean, those, those two factors really comes into play here. When you have a population that really want to change, economic change, uh, and also a youthful population that I see someone like Sonko and, and later Fire who identify with their realities, those two factors really push people. I think this is what we've seen across across West Africa recently. In fact, you know about the case of Nigeria's last election, where the question about economic prosperity and the voices of the youth were two key factors that drove uh, many parts of the results we had in the election. But also, I think it's, it's, it also shows the distrust that people in Senegal um, have uh, with, with the president, the now leaving president and his party, the Alliance Party. And, and, and the way the Alliance Party has been dishonest in the last few years, not only regarding the third term problem that, the, that they, they had to deal with, but also in, in terms of uh, not being clear regarding many of the uh, deals that Senegal has with France. So if you have a ruling party that people do not trust, oftentimes this is the result that you see. People being desperate to have a change. And it's what exactly happened in Senegal. Yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, that the new president seemingly does not have any, um, what do I call it? He's not, he's not held any elective uh, position before. And, you know, he, he's now going to lead a whole country without, you know, so much experience in that regard. That's, I mean, that's, that is a serious problem. But look at the, the folks who have been in power lately. They, they have all the experience. President Marquis Sol has been, has been former prime minister to President Abdullah Wade before the coming, becoming the president. And we see what happened during, during his tenure. The country was pretty much... Uh, you know, unstable. And I mean, the, the factor of not having experience comes into play. He's only, I mean, uh, this elected individual, uh, Basir Fai, was only a tax uh, manager. Uh, uh, pretty much that's the only encounter he's had with the government, apart from, you know, managing uh, the campaign of, of Sonko in 2019. But if you look at the key issues in Senegal today, this is a country that will be a major uh, part of the oil export or ex oil producing countries in Africa uh, this year, and unemployment problem, then the the massive reforms that has to be made in terms of legislature to avoid something like a, a president, you know, declaring for third term. I mean, all these things are massive changes that you need some experience to stay. However, if we've seen anything uh, recently, like in the case of Burkina Faso, even if you are young and you come into power, if you have the right support internationally and you have uh, the, the right motivations uh, to lead your people, you can actually move mountains. And I think the will of the people here has been made. You can see the massive support that FIRE has. So I think people will be patient with him. Yeah. But also, it's also points to the reason why he needs to mend fences and, you know, uh, make some consultations and, and, you know, try to bring people together, people that, you know, this, this election has thrown out part from the Sonko side to the present side. Right. Uh, Rahim Anoba, African Affairs Analyst, a pleasure having you today. Thank you, Joker.
Let's move on. A French court has confirmed the conviction of former Liberian rebel commander Kunti Kamara for his role during Liberia's civil war. Mr. Kamara was handed a 30-year sentence for violence against civilians and complicity in crimes against humanity. The crimes were found to have happened between 1993 and 1994. The ex-rebel commander was arrested in France in 2018 and was also accused of failing to prevent soldiers who were under his command from raping two teenage girls in 1994. The 49-year-old who was found guilty appealed against the ruling during his first trial in Paris in 2022. He was a regional commander of the United Liberation Movement of Liberia for Democracy, a rebel group that fought the National Patriotic Front of former President Charles Taylor. Some 250,000 people are estimated to have been killed in the West African nation during back-to-back -back conflicts from the late 1980s to the early 2000s. Meanwhile, French Member of Parliament have condemned the 1961 massacre of Algerians. This was overwhelmingly approved in a draft resolution by the French National Assembly. The resolution also called for an official day of commemoration. According to historians, some 300 protesters were killed when the police broke up a demonstration in support of Algerian independence. Some were beaten to death, while others drowned in the River Seine. The police officer in charge, Maurice Papon, was convicted following the incident for crimes against humanity and what they call collaboration with the Nazis. Over in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which has been seen intense fighting by the M23 rebels, particularly in the eastern part of the country, a special representative of the United Nations Secretary General, Bintu Keita, a calls for action to tackle the deteriorating humanitarian situation in the region. More than 71 million people are estimated to be internally displaced in eastern DRC alone, and over 20 million people are at risk of acute hunger. In eastern DRC, we are witnessing an intensification of the fighting and a deteriorating security and humanitarian situation. M23 continues to make significant advances and expansion of its territory to unprecedented levels. This has culminated in an even more disastrous humanitarian situation with internal displacement reaching unparalleled numbers. We must collectively pay more attention to the deepening humanitarian crisis stemming from the M23 escalation in North Kivu and prolonged armed violence in Ituri and South Kivu. More than 71 million people are internally displaced in Eastern DRC, an increase of 800,000 since my last briefing some three months ago. 23.4 million people are food insecure, which means that one in four Congolese faces hunger and malnutrition, making the Democratic Republic of Congo the country most affected by food insecurity. Welcome back. Activists and opposition leaders in Togo are calling for protests to stop the president from signing off a controversial constitutional reform. It comes as the country's parliament voted for a new constitution on Monday with changes the presidential system to a parliamentary one. Around 30 police officers armed with the truncheons broke up the gathering called by opposition parties and civil society groups on Wednesday. Police say the event in the capital, Lomé, was not authorized. Now with less than one month to the legislative elections, the opposition fears the change will clear the way for the long-serving president, Kore Nyasengbe, to extend his rule and remain in power indefinitely. The new constitution, which also increases presidential terms from five to six years, has been termed a coup by the opposition, saying it seeks to deprive the Togolese people the right to choose their president. Although the reform was passed by lawmakers earlier this week, it's unclear when the changes will come into force. Now, Rwanda has uh, received a second group of 
oh sorry, we're now in Central African Republic, where one of the country's main opposition leader has been given a one-year prison sentence for defamation and contempt of court. Uh, Krepe Mboli Gumba, a lawyer and coordinator for the opposition group, the RDC, was arrested earlier this month after accusing magistrates of corruption. He was ordered to pay a fine of around $130,000. Prosecutors had sought a one-year jail term for him. His lawyers, however, say that they would appeal against the sentencing. Human Rights Watch has accused President Faustin uh, Tuadera's regime of repressing civil society, media, as well as opposition parties. Now, Rwanda has received a second group of asylum seekers this week. They include 57 Eritrean nationals and 35 Sudanese. This comes days after 91 refugees and asylum seekers arrived in the country from Libya. According to the United Nations Refugee Agency, the 183 refugees and asylum seekers will remain in Rwanda pending the processing of their resettlement applications. Their arrivals are part of a program supported by the UN's Refugee Agency, African Union and European Union. Since 2019, the program has sent more than 2,200 refugees and asylum seekers of various nationalities from Libya to Rwanda. This development also comes as the UK attempts to pass new legislation that would allow it to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda. The UK Supreme Court had earlier quashed the plan, terminate unlawful. A quick check on the weather. At least six people have been killed after a tropical cyclone hit the northern region of Madagascar. The deadly disaster also forced 2,000 people out of their homes. Local officials say the flooding caused significant damage with roads and bridges affected. According to the Disaster Management Authority, some of the victims died after being hit by falling trees or collapsing houses, while others drowned. Well, it's still Women's Month and the British Council in Nigeria is celebrating differently. The focus is still on women, only this time a special group of women, those living with disabilities. During its first executive roundtable on diversity, participants heard from those changing the way we see people with disabilities and the world we all live in. Our correspondent, Amara Chubani, reports. It's also a reflection of how... This is the first time the British Council will be hosting this dialogue in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. I think we've lost Gabriel again. The theme for the event is inspiring inclusion for Africa's superwomen, the focus being on people living with disabilities. When we talk about inclusion, it's not just because it's for a select few. It's for all of us. Think about it. You start as a baby, you grow through life, you get old, you need care, you need adjustments. You suddenly realize that it's too steep to climb up the stairs. You suddenly realize that the light switches you can't really reach. So it's for all of us. And just like it was said earlier, the call to action is for all. While statistics paint a picture of the prevalence of disability being higher for women than men and males with disabilities having a higher representation in the workforce than women, it is still a fact that people living with disabilities have a lower rate of representation in the workplace. Our panelists, like many people, a panel discussion reveals the challenges facing this untapped human resource in Nigeria. The perception from the public, seeing women with disabilities, and they treat them as third-class citizens. For me, as I always say, women and girls with disabilities are at a zero percent level of participation in everything. I went for an interview. And immediately I walked in with my walking stick, the panelists looked at themselves and they said, Mr. Lugodi, um, you'll be out of this place in five minutes. You know, they said it in a very polite way, <laughs> but I knew it was an insult. When I started to really speak up and say, look, this condition is not a physical impairment, it's a developmental disability. 
that actually starts from my brain. The first stereotype is then you're supposed to be stupid. So if you're smart, how are you smart? They, however, refuse to see the disability in their condition. And some respondents highlight that not every disability is physical. We are ready to engage. We are ready to support you. Understand that we are, we are, diversity is present in all of us. Yes, somebody else might want to be called blind, another visually impaired. One might want to wear dark shades. Another might want to wear clear, whatever. Another might want to leave their face bare. Accept us. A lupus warrior cannot do a lot of things. I want to walk, but I have, I'm uh, induced by stress. So yeah, somebody that has lupus that don't even know, we have triggers and we keep being wrongly diagnosed. While they know you can tell they look or seem different, people living with disabilities do not want to be treated differently. And if for any reason you do not understand their disability, they say, just ask. Amarachi Ubani. Television the South African Reserve Bank's Monetary Policy Committee has once again kept the repo rate unchanged at 8.25%. This is the fifth consecutive hold by the central bank since May 2023. While this is good news for South Africans, the repo rate remains at a 14-year high with the Reserve Bank Governor Lasekia Kiangyago reiterating that the economic policy will remain restrictive. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Samosa, has more. The South African Reserve Bank has cited a positive inflation outlook as the reason to keep interest rates unchanged at 8.25%, making this the fifth hold since May last year. The MPC decided to hold the repo rate unchanged at 8.25%. The decision was unanimous. At this level of race, the policy stance is considered restrictive. Despite a jump in the consumer price index from 5.3% in January to 5.6% last month, the sub has once again kept the repo rate unchanged. Meanwhile, the General Industry Workers Union of South Africa strongly opposed this announcement. As we have said previously, this decision reflects the gulf that separates the horrendous nightmare that is the life of the masses of the working class and the middle class people and the paradise in palaces inhabited by the Monetary Policy Committee and the predatory financial elite that they serve. The current interest rates that the Reserve Bank maintains has had a devastating impact on the lives of ordinary people. The question is, how does the decision to keep the repo rate unchanged at 8.25% reflect the current state of South Africa's economy, particularly in light of its challenges and recent developments? Economist Elna Moulman explains. The Reserve Bank kept interest rates on hold despite the weakness in the economy. The SARP's approach at this stage is really just to argue that inflation is still somewhat elevated, towards the um, ceiling of its inflation target, and the inflation risks are still quite significant. And so if we get towards the second half of the year and these inflation risks don't materialize, there could be some scope for the Reserve Bank to provide a little bit of monetary policy relief. But we should really think of this just at, as marginal relief, in other words, at most 100 basis points of interest rate cuts. The key growth constraints at this stage are really coming from the infrastructure side, so electricity and logistical infrastructure constraints, and it is the extent to which we can sustainably and convincingly address these constraints that will ultimately determine our medium-term growth potential. The bank is only expected to start its rate-cutting cycle in the third quarter of this year. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channels Television News. That's Network Africa. Thank you for watching. I'm Jocker Rogers.